Hi, and welcome to the CEO Roundtable by Kiev Post. My name is Luke Shaney, and of course, I'm the CEO of Kiev Post, and I'm joined by all these great leaders. Sasha? Yes, my name is Alexander Kamarov. I'm uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Kiev Star, the biggest mobile and fixed telco in Ukraine. Luke, thank you for the invitation. Anna Derevyanka, CEO of European Business Association and Global Business for Ukraine. We are the biggest association for foreign business in Ukraine. I'm Alessandro Zanelli. I am uh, the CEO of uh, Nestle in Ukraine and Southeastern Europe, uh, proudly celebrating 30 years of presence of Nestle in Ukraine this year. Uh, Igor Smolensky, CEO of Ukrainian Postal Service. We are probably the only company that works in all 27,000 Ukrainian cities and villages, so uh, happy to be here. So everybody, thank you. You know, this is, this is great, and I can't believe that we managed to get you all on such a busy schedule. So listen, there's been a lot of setbacks in the last two and a half years, three years, maybe since, even since 2014, since all this really began. Uh, you know, there's been bombings, there's been hackings, you know, your towers, God knows what you're going through every day. How have you, as CEOs in your companies, how do you deal with these setbacks, setback after setback, and what keeps you going forward? It seems to me we should start from Sasha, from Alexander, yeah. because actually he never stopped. And it seems to me from the day one of the war, we actually had communication and we had telecommunication. So in this respect, thank you to you. So please. Okay, actually, I think we all never stop, mm. honestly, because production is running, post service is running, delivery service is running, telco is running. And of course... But we, we needed mobiles. Yes, we need, we, need, <laughs> yes, we need infrastructure, let's say, in general terms. So as we realized in the end of 2022, we need electricity sometimes even more than, let's say, yeah. communication, because without electricity... And we saw it this summer, huh? <laughs> Yes, yes, it's true. It's, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, it's, it's a very broad question, okay? So I think we're all, to some extent, on duty. Okay, on duty from different perspectives, mm -hmm. from our, I don't know, job description perspective, from our patriotic perspective, because, you know, so I'm, I'm Ukrainian, so I'm running Ukrainian company, probably during the most difficult time in our history. Okay, and of course, it's all this sense of responsibility is extremely important. And then what you do, you apply your best efforts, your best skills, your best values, okay, in order to shape the whole organization to move forward, to be resilient as much as possible, okay, and to somehow, I think this is the biggest challenge, to combine this resilience, crisis management, okay, understanding that everything can go in a wrong way, like example with our cyber attack on Kyiv Star, okay, with necessity to develop. Because it's not about survival, it's also about development. And for me, it's about system, for me, it's about adaptation of our mission. So our mission right now is save Ukraine, help people. So just simple one, a very simple priorities. You need to simplify, you need to reduce number of priorities, okay? You need to streamline resources. You need to create a mechanism of decision-making that will help to fulfill the priorities with the right action steps, decision-making process, okay? And this is in place. Of course, you need to have a team, professional, patriotic team that will run the business, okay? So you need to sacrifice to some extent, of course, but, uh, you know, so we're all suffering. Someone on the front line, you know, number of people from different psychological traumas, you know, so we need to sacrifice, but we need to go forward. We need to communicate. Actually, I'm communicating every day. So literally during the hardest time, it was a daily direct line with employees. Okay, so few months of war, time of cyber attack, and even right now, it's a big weekly direct line. So just to, to, to enforce, to amplify, to deliver actually the same messages at the end. Okay, but people should be relatively confident that organization is somehow understand what necessary to do, what should be done, how it will be done, and what is their role, and to what extent they are secure. So okay. it's, 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 and it's, it's impossible to, to have one element in mind. So it's a, it's a systematic crisis approach with a lot of emphasis in mind because it's still very difficult time for the people. And Igor, what do you think? 
Uh, I mean, first of all, you should take it with a sense of humor because uh, take everything uh, <laughs> take everything seriously. You cannot. I mean, I was told I'm a veteran. I'm, I'm like the longest country. running CEO in the state sector, almost nine in years. Years. And obviously, if I would not have a sense of humor, I would not be able to survive, right? So you can stress about how, when I started as a CEO, if I would known about COVID, about war, and you can think, can it get any worse? Uh, but on the other hand, you can think, okay, can we surprise? And can we keep, as Alexander said, people motivated? So for example, Ukraposhta got the prize for the fastest international delivery in the world, fourth place in the world, with zero airports. We're delivering to Australia for in 10, 14 days. We're delivering to US and Canada in six to eight days. Uh, so uh, you have to keep people motivated so they can they can take their minds off what they go through every day. And obviously, we have to be there. I mean, like, the day after tomorrow, we'll go again to the front lines, to Pokrovs, to Kramatorsk, to be with people on the ground, to understand even small things. So for example, small things as United Nations refugee sets for uh, evacuating people don't have sweets and people under stress want to get chocolate. So uh, you have to... Uh, <laughs> so, so. I'm not kidding. Uh, you, you have, <laughs> that's uh, why you're wearing yeah. white. We, 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 we brought and we, uh, we sell them chocolate because that helps them go through oh, it. We, uh, donate. <laughs> we should donate more. Uh, we, we're evacuating tons of trucks now with people evacuating from the Donetsk region. We have like 20 ton trucks, like three or four trucks per day to help them evacuate. And at the same time, we're signing agreements with the leading international companies to help them uh, deliver to Ukraine. So I think with that purpose in mind, and uh, as Alexander said, uh, we obviously model winter. What happens if, I don't know, if there is no electricity? Well, we have Starlink generators and power banks. What happens if there is no mobile? So we're now writing a software because we propose to move to 100% digital so we can have our back office no, anywhere. No competition? So but And what, what, we, what we face is now, so we're writing a software where we can uh, transfer the data Bluetooth to Bluetooth in case the mobile does not work uh, and we need Incredible. to transfer wow, the data incredible. for the parcel delivery. So you just model what will happen in the winter because computer does not switch on if there is less than five degrees in the room. So you have to uh, wow. you have to foresee all those things. It's like a chess game. And you play the chess in your mind uh, almost every day uh, to try to stay one step ahead of, uh, like for example, do I need to equip my uh, trucks with REB? So they can, uh, if, sure. they, if they drive in the Donetsk region, they can you know, preclude a drone attack or something. So oh. you, every day it's, uh, it keeps you going. I think it's good. Um, everyone is asking what I'm going to do after. It's like, I'm going to the beach. I'm switching off the phone. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to the beach. But until then, you just have to keep going. Ah, it's outstanding what, uh, what they are saying. Because it's, in fact, it's all about communication. Being authentic with, uh, with uh, open communication and be able to listen to, to our people. Because in, uh, one thing is, of course, communicate, but there's a two ways communication, ability to listen and act. Because the credibility comes with actions that are in support of, uh, of the people. How can we keep them motivated? By really being able to capture, and you mentioned surprise. Surprise is also a key element. Go one step uh, in front and, and understand what is needed. We created, for example, last year, winter package, we, uh, which we gave to our people the possibility to face the winter from close point of view, from electricity point of view, with uh, you, you, uh, you, you mentioned power banks, but also uh, with lights, with <laughs> chocolate as well, because it, it helps. We created within Nestle what we call Ukraine We Care program, and yeah. it is an umbrella for everything what we could do for our people to keep the motivation. Because these companies, my company, you create the sense of purpose. You create the, the sense of belonging and the pride of being, in my case, Nestleans. So I have 5,500 Nestleans on top of being Ukrainians, which are really proud of uh, working for Nestle because we are, we are doing the best for them. And uh, as we are all doing, we are also trying to do the best for, for the society with sure. all the donations that we have done, the support to uh, rehabilitation centers, uh, uh, um, like superhuman and unbroken. So this open communication uh, and authentic message, the idea of really action, 
is not only communication but action, consistent, sure. consistent action, and ability uh, to surprise. We create a foundation for all the employees that have uh, uh, the house partially or completely destroyed during the the shelling. We supported already 73 uh, employees which have submitted their request. This is a self-financing foundation with our employees, they, they donate, and uh, Nestle corporate double always the amounts that we collect. And on a so six you buy houses phases. for your people? No, we are giving them money Financial to start loans. the repair mm -hmm. uh, from windows mm -hmm. to uh, bigger reparations. Uh, we have three clusters of uh, support. We so cannot on, buy on the, the houses. Repar uh, only reparations. Uh, the reparations, no, no, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this also was a surprise, that's and, and that's how we you keep the troop, the coalition united, and uh, and uh, yeah, uh, and I'm, I'm unbreakable. So. Yeah, how do you keep 900 plus companies motivated to continue investing? To be serious, uh, I think that actually why we are all together because we are all working very hard in order to actually to withstand, in order to overcome this difficult situation. We as the team understand that all our members are going through troubles, severe troubles, and we as the team of uh, almost yeah. 80 professionals, we understand that we have to serve your needs. We have to support you actually to go sure. through this terrible time, very terrible time all together. And at least we as the team try to facilitate things and we try to make it at least somehow easier to overcome all this. Yeah. And but nevertheless, I think that all together we grouped our efforts, forces, and we understood that there is no other option. There is no choice. So we have to go through this. We have to withstand. So and this uh, actually uh, make me to the point, bring me to the point that uh, I'm proud for our members. They are just simply incredible. I can uh, really underline that this is amazing how resilient our member companies and beyond are in Ukraine in order to go through the war time. Good. But look, I think uh, what uh, my lesson is, uh, if uh, I mean, I grew up in a doctor's family, so if I can compare it, uh, if you stop operations, right, then you need to do like resuscitation. So keeping your heart going it's yeah. much easier and you have yeah. higher chance yeah. of survival than what I've seen. The companies that pulled out and left and tried to come back, I don't yeah. even, no, can, I cannot even yeah. name one success that was able to recover. Why? People don't trust that you're not going to leave a second time. It's true. Um, there's lack of people. So I think even if you can keep a little bit going, you need to keep going. And, you know, That's smaller true. presence yeah. is much better than yeah. no presence because it, it gives you the basis uh, to uh, to keep going. And, and people are very motivated as well. The point is, like in, in, in case of Kharkiv, for example, your plant, etc. It seems to me people are in really necessity to work. They ask CEOs actually to step in. They ask to continue working. This is really incredible. Uh, because I think right now in Ukraine, within the current circumstances, working business is the most stable platform for employees, for people, because this is something they can rely mm -hmm. on. Okay, and this is extremely important because uncertainty in the air. Mm -hmm. So your future is unclear, okay? Yeah. Plenty of limitations. But if you have a stable working business with a good sense, okay, with a good, I will say, input into the country, overall resilience into the war, <laughs> I think this provides them sense of belonging to something exactly. really big yeah, and important. Mm -hmm. You're right. And we went through this process. We went through the process of uh, guaranteeing uh, as, as you said, we, we also have uh, uh, protect and support. And protect is, first of all, our people. And we went through the protection of the safety, safety being physical safety at the physical beginning. Safety, Immediately, yeah. financial safety was important. And they went all, all hands in hands. And of course, we need to learn how to make the prepayments, how to pay the bonus, how to keep paying the salaries. Paying the salaries is a way also to survive the hardest time of the war. And now we are very much focused on the mental mm -hmm. uh, health safety. Yeah. Because yeah. To, uh, we, we learn how to be safe physically. Mm -hmm. We learn how to be financial sound. We are still learning how to cope with the pressure of the war. And every behind every individual, 5,500 employees that I have, 5,500 um, Nestleans, there is a story. There is a story of a pain. And it's very important that they feel the sense of belonging. They feel that they can refer, they can hook their pain to something, to someone, either the, the leader of the company, either the different leaders, either the company itself. The, the company will be there and will be there to stay. As you said, we need to keep business running. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, our most difficult time was having the factory in Kharkiv not running for 10 months. Finally, wow. we find a solution. We mm-hmm. find a solution. We put different type of shelters which are online, basically close to the, not online, but <laughs> close to the line. And uh, the workers can reach it in 10 seconds because uh, we have shelters there, but they could reach it in three minutes and it's yeah. too long for Kharkiv. For Kharkiv, it's... So that, we that's put, way, you, you learn how to break the rules. Right. Yeah, because if you follow the law, cool. you're, you're not going to be able to Absolutely build the shelter. Absolutely not. Uh, and you basically, as by the way, corporate governance also doesn't work during the war. Um, <laughs> 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 no, I mean, a good example, right? I'm a CEO of the company of 30,000 plus people. So if I would have a, which uh, my creditors really want me to, chief risk officer, that person probably would forbid me from going to the front lines mm-hmm. because I'm a single executive yeah. entity of the company, yeah. right? Would they listen? No, it's like, so what's the point of writing the memo to the board if I'm still going to go, right? We, we just, you know, uh, we'll just waste the risk management committee meeting. Uh, yeah. So um, you learn that uh, in the war, uh, there are different rules. So, for example, we, we follow the rules, they called, you know, a tier of broken windows. If it was shelled during the night, we have to be operational by midday. Mm-hmm. We have to give that purpose to employees to get back after shelling and restore the branch. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have to give people sense that when they pass the post office, they see it's still working. We also learn that you're not going to be popular mm. because no matter what you do, wow. uh, someone's going to not like it. So if we go and work on the front lines, I'm going to get hit that I'm putting people on the danger. If I don't go and work on the front lines, I said, you know, I left people without food and pensions and everything. So it doesn't matter what they do. You don't win. Uh, I said, you just bring a sense yeah. of humor. They said, they're not going to like me anyway. I'll just pick whatever, um, no. whatever the option is. So look, it's been two and a half, almost three years of this war. There's been the unwanted stress test that, you know, pushed on you, stress tests and everything. And sometimes you make, as you said, you can't be popular all the time. Alexander, what's, what would you say has been the decision that you're the most proud of? And at the same time, what's the thing that you say, I wish I could have made a different decision, you know, looking in hindsight? Uh, honestly, there is no one decision that I'm so proud of, to be, to be honest. Yeah. I think what we achieved is the result of, let's say, numbers, probably thousands of different decisions. I'm proud of the result based on the thousands of the decisions and, uh, let's say, kind of transformed through the collective efforts because this is a team result, okay? But I have regrets. And I already answered this question one year ago, so probably the only one area that we missed is energy because we start preparation for the war somewhere in the middle of 2021 Okay, we start to invest really hard money in uh, during the autumn of 2021. Okay, but we fully missed the energy component. So during the first attack, our let's say redundancy time for the whole network was around one hour. Okay, at the end of 2022, right now we have four hours. Four, but this is enormous you know, efforts, I investments, and you know, so there's hundreds of thousand generators uh, of batteries and generators across the whole network, you know, so this is probably the only one, I will say, area that I'm still, let's say, feel uncomfortable. Uh, why did you start actually preparing only in 2021? Did you get a signal from the government no, that it's, no, it's going to no, be no, 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 I think this is a, uh, an example of, let's say, healthy corporate risk management system. You know, they can be a barrier. They can ask stupid bureaucratic questions, but at the end, on your risk register, you have a risk risk of war. And then you start to interpret this risk. Yeah. You, uh, you should every quarter deliver something to the business risk committee of the board and to the board. Yeah. Okay, and then it's a kind of evolution because our first approach was that it will be a kind of escalation in the East. Yeah. how we can prepare to this escalation, what we can this do. This was a scenario, but yeah. somewhere in September, we realized that it might not be an escalation at least. Well, we also so started in April 21, uh, and the first meetings uh, as a security committee were, very, what are we very talking awkward. about? You very know? But, very but we have been asked to prepare, so we prepare, but we didn't know exactly what to prepare for. Thanks God that we started in April 2021, because yes. then, unfortunately, we were yes, sure. relatively ready. Not for this full-scale invasion, but for sure. We were. And Igor, how was, how was it for you knowing that you were already, I, I don't want to say it in a light way, but you'd already had practice since 2014 dealing with a war that was already going on? Do you think that you had a... An advantage yeah, we, we, on being ready for it. Yeah, I mean, we have an advantage even now. So, for example, Kupiansk did not have heat for the past winter. 
we operated there, so now we know what we tried there. Now we can uh, okay. basically spread that experience throughout the country. So we have, you know, unfortunate and unfortunate uh, circumstances where, since we are working close to the front lines, working where uh, no one else is working, we can try certain things, know in advance what will and will not work. For example, I did not know Starlings don't work when the rev work. Right, so you hypothetically presume that Starlink should give you the power, uh, the uh, communication, and it doesn't. So uh, now we're going yeah. to plan B, plan C, and uh, it helps us uh, to uh, to adapt uh, constantly. I mean, there is no way we can predict uh, what will happen next. Any decisions that you wish you would have made different? Yes, move to more robotics and digitalization because it's constant. Uh, constant uh, competition, uh, how do you reduce number of people you need for the operations? Mm -hmm. Because we can probably, unfortunately, say it's going to be huge competition for labor, no matter how you slice it. I mean, uh, hopefully it's going to be a victory. There will be lack of people to rebuild. Mm -hmm. There is a lack of people today. So anything you can do to optimize, for example, we fully digitalized back office, which means we can now take it from back office in Donetsk, in Kharkiv, and put it in Ternopil, which is safer. Uh, at least there is no 39 seconds uh, from the rocket hit. So um, if I could do it again, I would just move to anything digital and robotic I could ahead of time and made in Ukraine. Because as we learn, unfortunately, yeah. uh, Western companies cannot support uh, the equipment they are selling to Ukraine or uh, the program because the risk managers don't allow the engineers come and uh, support the equipment. Wow. So uh, we, uh, over this year, Korpochta will move to 100% digital robotic um, processing of uh, parcels. It's all wow. equipment made in Ukraine. It's designed, made, produced, and software written in Ukraine. But this doesn't surprise me. Ukraine was always outsourcing all its robotics, its digitization and everything that they were doing in the past. And yeah, well, Great examples here. I, I'm reflecting also on a personal side, and I think the decision to stay in Ukraine, which was not uh, what you were talking about breaking the, the rules. Well, uh, Nestle wanted me to ask me, what, what, what do you want to do? And the, this, but this, for me, the decision to stay was very important because it helped me uh, to understand uh, uh, what to do and to act fast and to uh, to push for certain things, which I really I'm really proud. Which is, for example, the investment that we have decided to make during the war to open a new factory, which uh, we we are going to open at, by the end of the year. Um, in terms of something that I regret, well, uh, as I said before, we had a, a number of scenarios. Uh, uh, we should have probably more. Uh, really prepared for the worst. We were n never prepared for the worst. We were prepared for the middle scenario. Uh, and that gave us uh, uh, a little bit of gap in terms of uh, uh, reactions to what could be uh, the worst. Uh, um, the other thing, yeah, uh, uh, the unpredictability. Uh, the, we, we thought that, that uh, electricity will be a big hit for the winter. But in fact, it has been uh, before reaching winter, we have to pass the summer. And I can tell you, due to the big heat and the, uh, on the overall gaps of electricity, uh, also with the trade and the customers and consumer behavior, I believe that we should have done a little bit more preparation for that. Okay. But look, just one comment. I think since we are probably addressing uh, in Western auditor, right, that uh, has some corporate, yeah, corporate, yeah. Uh, corporate questions. So I can tell that going to unpopular decisions, one of the decisions I don't regret, even though they were unpopular, on the third month of the war, I canceled distant work. I said, anybody who wants to work in Okroposhta has to show up at work. Oh, wow. Um, and it's probably the best decision I've made. Because I've seen how much, how you can piss off your employees if someone's managing them from outside of Ukraine or even outside of the region. Because sure. they're managing through Telegram channels. They don't have a feel, one way or the other, what's on the ground. And I think that was the most important. So that's why we were able to contain the team. Uh, the team felt, I mean, I'm constantly going, the manager's constantly on the ground. You cannot substitute. this In IT, probably you can do it. Uh, if your people on the ground, you either with them, or you, you don't have a moral right during the war, tell them to open or not to open. 
Uh, for example, you know, in Ukraine, I'm supposed to close the branches during the air attack. I have 4,000 branches. If I keep closing them during attack, I would never open in Kharkiv anyway because yeah. it's constant attack. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know what? The manager will decide, knowing where the location, they will decide to open or not to open. And uh, so this moral factor, uh, you know, I study all these Western practices, people talking about distant work. It works and it doesn't. And uh, the moral factor, uh, even for the top management, it turns out uh, moral uh, factor was more important than professional. Yeah. If you're a great professional, but you don't have this EQ, you're not going to be able to be successful uh, during the war. Okay. Uh, recruitment is becoming, it has been a very big problem, but now it's becoming a bigger problem, you know? Basically, of people moving abroad, uh, you know, not trying to get the devaluation, salaries, competition, and it's, I know we've had many discussions about that. Considering that, there are so many women that have left Ukraine because of the war. Can you tell me though, like, you know, you know, knowing all of the companies out there, how has the ratio been for the last few years and now with the war? It's not just about women, but re bringing people back, you know, the, the yeah, whole look, issue. Uh, when, when it comes to women, uh, we just checked in our database and we see that 20% of CEOs in our database are women. So it's not that bad. Of course, it could be better. Uh, and I know also that a number of women, female CEOs, are also staying in Ukraine, like the CEO of Metro, for example. She is staying yeah. all the time here. But it could be worse. When it comes to actually okay. uh, bringing people uh, to Ukraine, uh, you know, when uh, we got to know that there is a very nice idea to launch uh, the ministry, the new ministry, how to bring back Ukrainians, I was a little bit, you know, surprised. Why? Because it seems to me people, including women, they will be able to come back when there will be more security in, in country, when the war is going to be over or at least some sort of settlement will be in place. I think it's going to be, uh, I'll say now, a very unpopular thing, but... Uh, the war for talent with Europe will begin on the first day of victory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. be because um, I believe Europe will not be happy if Ukrainians will come back. Mm -hmm. It's great. Of course. It's a great labor source. Yeah. So I highly doubt that someone will want to finance, for example, a plant or factory in Pokrovsk. So people uh, will come back. Yeah. Uh, that's, I think, reality. The second the thing, obviously, a factor where do they want to come back? Come back coming back to Ukraine is a very, uh, very broad. wide and broad term, right? If you were from Mariupol, are you going to uh, have something to come back to? So if you work with right. Azovstal, yeah. right? So coming back to Ukraine is the two part. One is you're coming back to Kyiv because you are from Kyiv. Uh, if you're from Bakhmut, right? 80,000 people from Bakhmut, uh, where are they coming to? So they have to evaluate coming to Ukraine to no apartment that you know they have, so they have to rent yeah. an apartment or staying in Europe where they also don't have an apartment. So it it will be a more complicated issue, but I agree fully with Anna. It depends on the opportunities, but again, the war for talent uh, after the war will just begin. Yeah, but even foreigners, we also see and monitor that many foreigners would like to come uh, here already. And they, they really see better opportunities in terms of money uh, actually being earned here. So in this respect, I guess uh, it's just necessary also to make sure that the war is over and then both foreigners and Ukrainians, I'm sure that they will come back. Yeah, sure, but I like your optimism. And I'm sure <laughs> that the, day, the, the first day after the war is won, all investments will come, reconstruction will come, but we need to manage that bridge. And the war of talent in this moment is happening uh, already in, in Ukraine. We, we lost, let's be honest, we lost 30% of the workforce. Mm -hmm. We can guess uh, the numbers, but if 10 uh, million Ukrainians are not here, and no, like seven, including the kids, etc., and one is in the front, this is 30% of the workforce, of, uh, of skilled workforce. So. And all the industry, and we are doing this with EBA, we are doing this with different in, in, industries, we need to reskill people, upskill, clearly enlarge the, the, the opportunities with, with what we have, invest in youth to start uh, early and uh, clearly to engage them immediately after study or during the study to, uh, to start to work as early as, uh, as possible. Work with our veterans. The, ensure yeah. that the veterans are back and they are welcome back mm -hmm. and ensure that they find themselves in, in, in the right conditions, including their families, to be, to be back at work. Uh, in, a, in a certain sense, we are also rehiring certain people that was retired That's and we nice. ask them to come back because they have incredible skills. Mm -hmm. 
which is difficult to rebuild, and we want them to pass to the next generation. So, That's in this moment, mean, yeah. I think we all of us we are we know fighting we need to do for this. We need to break the rules. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you, 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 that's a quote of this meaning, break the rules. No, the I mean, is, uh, for, for, for what I, I fully agree anyway. with you, but when you don't have enough people, you know what, as a country, your goal, goal number one is? To get the most efficiency you can. How do you get the most efficiency? You have to get the best people. How do you get the best people, the best opportunity? You'll get rid of labor code. You get, let the companies hire the best because they will bring the company up and then the opportunity yeah, for yes. middle quality people and lower quality will appear. If you constrain the company, which, you know, since we accession to EU, we have to abide by the labor code and all that stuff, which uh, will stay on the way of reconstruction. Uh, so if you don't break those rules, we are not going to be able, uh, you don't play, I give always the example. Imagine we, not imagine, I hope it will happen, we free up Bakhmut and we want to build a kindergarten for people to come back there. Imagine we, we're doing it by the rules. Three years minimum. Yeah. You will do public procurement for the project. Yeah. You'll do public procurement for general contracting. Yeah, you will get a bunch of people with ecology standards, etc. So by the, by the end of the day, there will be no kindergarten. And as we do now, in the school operations, everything else, if you do unusual moves, you win. If you follow by the standard book, you lose because you can really get a few steps ahead. But the point that the situation is so dynamic, it changes uh, every day and sometimes quite often every hour. So that's why we as CEOs, as leaders, we have to adjust every, every and day. And adapt. This and is adapt. our motto. Yes. Adjust and adapt, exactly. adapt and adjust. Yeah. Listen, CEOs around the world are seen as these mythical figures that everyone says, I'm a CEO, look at my business card. Everyone dreams to have this position, but nobody understands the, the stress that comes into this. And how do you deal in general, knowing that you're responsible for thousands of people in your company on every decision you're gonna make, and more so, how do you deal that every decision you make can affect millions of people with their daily lives? And their, how do you balance this, the enormity that you guys have on your backs and the responsibility to a nation? You, you said it before, you need to bring some humor. So. There is a lot of stress, and I always try to compensate, to compensate the stress with a bigger amount of pride and a bigger amount of, of uh, let's say, try to live in the normal way. Uh, the stress is there. I don't need to describe the stress that we are living to, uh, every day, the, the stress of going to the shelter, the, the stress of the Syrians, the, the stress of the drones attack. But uh, bringing good news, bringing the sense of pride, bringing opportunities, uh, making uh, my family proud of, uh, of the fact that, uh, in this case, Nestle is doing something good and is recognized, etc. Sure. I always try to bring tones of pride and tones of uh, uh, good mood, happiness, happy smiles, to compensate the stress. But you're if, Italian, you know, that's naturally... <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> it's, 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 it's in his blood. <laughs> it's in his blood, he doesn't have a choice, but... Sasha, how do you do? Uh, Sorry, I didn't mean I to... Think, uh, you know, I think, as a people, we are extremely adaptive. Let's say, adaptive yeah. animals to some extent. Okay, this is first. Second, I am quite sure that the worst is in the future. Because right now, we are on mission. We are running businesses, and to be very honest, we have li really fragments for the family, just a limited time for the family, where we are kind, sweet, but I can imagine that in the future, we are stress eaters, adrenaline junkers, okay? So yeah. that we will face plenty of time with family. We will try to run for family as an enterprise. <laughs> but do you and feel, this will be the most difficult situation, I think. But do you, feel right that, now, do you feel that those little moments, as you said, that when you're with your family, is it somehow kind of reboots you inside of in course. order to of say, finally, I need a break, I need to focus of on the family? Of course, of course. You, 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 this is part of your purpose. Yes, otherwise, you this. become a robot. Really. No, it's true, it's true, true. You need someone, you know, close to you who can, you can share. You. It's, 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 it's a difficult type of, let's say, life. It's a difficult type of emotions, and you need this in order to reload. There is no other way for me. I give an example, sorry. We learn a new sport. Paddle. We didn't know what was paddle. paddle. <laughs> and suddenly, now, all together, yeah, pickleball is more yeah. US, but uh, Europe is more <laughs> on paddle. So, okay, let's go and, and start a, a new sport, and we learn a new sport, paddle, and now it's a source of, uh, let's say, diversion, yes. and uh, as, a, as a new source of uh, happiness, as I, happiness, as I mentioned before, and doing something together. 
I mean, for me, it was a bit of a challenge since uh, being a CEO of a strategic company, I face I miss the security uh, limitations. And especially after we did our stamp, uh, my family had to close all the social media accounts because they get a bunch of hate from Russia. And um, it's an issue wow. where I cannot tell them where I go. And um, even when I visit them, I usually don't obviously announce it. So um, it's something by now they get used to. It was hard uh, at the beginning. Uh, so Especially my kids in school cannot tell, or should not have told. They probably did. Uh, who their father is? <laughs> Close uh, their kids. <laughs> it's my dad. Uh, yeah, especially after I did the stamp with this. I mean, they were extremely proud of me. But um, you know, it's uh, as Alexander said. Uh, you do it now. Your understanding, as I called, you know, when you pick a job, uh, it's usually salary time uh, with your family and professional interest. And it's like three parts, which usually uh, is the same number of like water inside, right? So it's one is higher, the other one is lower. So. Uh, you do it for now, you understand what you do it, you do it for, uh, you should be proud and your kids should be proud of what you do. It's actually an easy test. When you're not sure what you do, you test whether uh, what are they going to say. Um, and then you hope that sometime in the future you will get to go to the beach without the phone, without tracking, without uh, warnings. Uh, and. Um, yeah. You will feel normal again, um, and you try to be as normal as uh, possible in the circumstances. Obviously, you need to read books, you need to have sports, you need to talk to the nature, you have to have to your, your family. But with all respect, there will be no balance, because still, whether you, pay, uh, you play paddle or whether you are doing other things, still, there is no balance, work and line so balance. Good. And in this respect, still, I remember when I went now to Ukraine, my kids were saying to me, oh, mom, I'm so sorry that you actually missed my first day in the school, actually, because he went to the, uh, the third grade. And in, actually, in this respect, he was very sorry that I was not able to monitor his actually going with his visit to the school. So, Either you want it or not, you have to take decision that actually you take responsibility and you actually sacrifice certain things for the sake of the team, for the sake of result, for the, ta for the sake of the company. And in case actually we are going ahead, excellent results, yes, it also refilled with, with pride, with actually with, with joy, etc. And uh, of, of course it refilled. The, the there is a the work-life balance, it's just really bad balance. Bad balance. There is no, <laughs> there is no balance. <laughs> actually, I was you know, talking about work-life balance, somebody told me once I was interviewing um, a big CEO who uh, launched Booking.com. Yeah. And I asked him the question, I said, do you believe in work-life balance? And he goes, work-life balance is a myth. Work-life balance is how you react to a decision that is put in front of you. Yeah. Do you decide I want to do this or I want to do that? But there is no such thing as work-life no, balance. It's no, how you react no. to situations that creates a work-life balance. I say it's slightly different. I think it's, it's very personal. Yeah. I may... <laughs> I may look un completely unbalanced to my team or to you, but I feel overall balanced. <laughs> so it, it, it is really personal. You're, and it is really the way you really you find the way to recharge yourself. We, okay. we, we discussed many times with our team, uh, with our management team, I say we have developed this eternal resilience. This is what we call it in our, in our uh, team now over the last two and a half years. The ability to rebuild ourselves, rebuild our energy. Never, it doesn't matter what happened yesterday, today will be different, but we have eternal resilience. And sure. this is what we are aiming to constantly rebuild ourselves, by the way, and being this uh, propeller for the whole organization uh, to perform. You know, there is a famous movie, Devil's Advocate. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a good uh, one. And you said, Vin oh, yeah. Vanity is my favorite scene, right? So at the end of the day, you know why you occupy this position. If you would want to, you would not want to occupy this position. Yeah. Uh, and if the balance tilts in some other way, then you leave. And uh, you'll be comfortable with that decision. But so. it's so interesting to be the CEO. It's <laughs> really, <laughs> <laughs> it motivates. So just to close off, I would like to just give a speed round, like very, very quickly with all of you. Do you have a quote or a saying of what it's like to do business in Ukraine to survive? That I believe personally that many of your stories are going to end up in the curriculum at Harvard, at Penn State, and at all these places because no one else has faced these types of crises and survived. So I think we're going to be seeing your names in the books. But do you have one sentence that sums up what is doing business in Ukraine? Just make it happen. Break the rules, right? Break the rules and make it <laughs> no, happen. No, 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 this is, this, is, this is the second phrase. <laughs> if you are going through hell, keep going. Right. So. No, I, I really like this eternal resilience. 
Yeah. I think we are to some extent on mission from a very broad perspective. Okay. And I think the only one I will see driver this internal resilience. So we do understand why we are here, what we are doing, what we would like to achieve. At the beginning of the war, I needed to go out from Ukraine for, for, uh, for three months because I, I could not stay in the eye of the storm. Mm. I need to go out to be able to see the storm and manage the storm and then I come sure. back. But I felt pain. I really was living for three months in, in Chisinau, in Moldova, and I, feeling, I was feeling pain. I would prefer to be in the, with him, but I was feeling pain. And I realized that you can put me out of Ukraine, but you cannot put Ukraine out of me. Yes, and this is my sentence. Absolutely. <laughs> Plus creativity and agility. I Absolutely. think this is the thing. You, yeah. Yeah, you don't have a choice. Listen, I feel that this conversation could go on for another two yeah, hours. Yeah, I, I really feel, yeah, but I'm trying to be respectful for your time. Everybody, thank you so much. <laughs>